Okay, uh, uh, can you check if the sound is coming? Can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, so tomorrow I have office hours from 12 to 1.30 in DL259 and then 3.30 to 4. 3.30 to 4 in also in DL259. So don't come to my room, but come to DL259 and we'll be able to discuss whatever needs to be discussed. Um, the other thing I wanted to let you know is three pages of cheat sheets, so do remember. So you, have, you can put things on both the sides, so you have total six pages that you can bring. Um, and what else? SEIs, please do fill SEIs. Uh, I think tomorrow is the last date when you can fill SEIs. You cannot fill it on the day of final exam. So please make sure that you fill it up by tomorrow. Uh, oh, syllabus. Everything until lead and lag compensator, including lead and lag compensator design. So everything is part of the syllabus. All right. So today, the goal of today's lecture is to put everything in perspective. We have studied a lot of different topics, and we want to know how they all fit together within the umbrella of control systems. So I'm going to write control systems here. And it has three pillars. The first pillar was stability. So for open loop, how do you determine the stability of a control system? For open loop system, Ruth Hurwitz. So we use Ruth Hurwitz to determine whether a system is stable or not. So of course, the, the easiest way is to compute what where the poles are. But of course, in many cases, if you have higher order polynomials, it's very difficult to know where the poles are. So you basically use Ruth Hurwitz to identify uh, how many poles are in the left half plane versus how many poles are in the right half plane, okay? So you can use Ruth Hurwitz to determine stability of an open loop system. For closed loop, what were the two stability topics we touched upon? How do you determine the stability of a closed loop system? Well, we talked about uh, Nyquist plot, so z equals to n plus z equals to n plus p, and then we used gain margin and phase margin in the body plot. So that's another way to know whether the closed loop system is going to be stable or not. I yeah. thought if we had the closed loop transfer function, we can use the Ruth array on that. Yes, you can use the Ruth array on that. Okay. Yeah. Do we, when do we care about open loop stability? Well, you know, when you, this is open loop, right? This is closed loop. Right? Okay, so, so when I talk about this closed loop and Nyquist plot and gain margin and phase margin, you essentially look at GC multiplied by G. Okay? And based on the Bode plot of, or Nyquist plot of GC multiplied by G, you determine whether the closed loop system is unstable or not or based on the gain margin and phase margin of GC multiplied by G, you determine whether the closed loop system will be stable or not, right? Okay. So stability was one of the major issues in control system, and we have learned three different ways to determine stability of closed loop system. So Ruth Horvitz, in order to do Ruth Horvitz, you need to know the transfer function, GS or 
GCG over 1 plus GCG, you need to know this transfer function. In order to compute the, in order to understand whether a closed loop system is stable or not, you plot the Nyquist plot of GC multiplied by G, or if you have H, let me put H also here. So you use Nyquist GCGH to determine if the closed loop system is going to be stable or not, or you use uh, margin. So these are all MATLAB commands. So margin GCGH to determine if the closed loop system is going to be stable or not. So you want the both, both the gain margin as well as the phase margin to be uh, positive for the closed loop system to be stable. If any of them is negative, then the closed loop system becomes unstable. Okay. So stability is the bare minimum requirement. It just guarantees that the system will not blow up, uh, but it doesn't guarantee much, okay? So in order to guarantee something more complicated, we look at performance specification. And so there are two types of performance specification. So transient performance specification and then steady state performance specification. So typically steady state performance specification would be in form of ESS. So steady state error with respect to certain input. And we use final value theorem to compute it. Transient performance is written in terms of percent overshoot, settling time, rise time, and uh, peak time. EP. Okay, so these are usual transient performance specification, and we studied three controllers to change the transient performance or meet the transient performance specification. What were those? So basic proportional controller. So just K. KP, and the method we studied was root locus method to design an appropriate controller for KP to meet the transient performance specification. Then we talked about PD controller. And PID controller, so PD, PID, So PID also meets steady state performance specification, so I'm going to put PID in that as well. So we studied PD and PID controllers, which are of the form, let me write PD only first. So this is K S plus Z. PID K S plus Z1, S plus Z2 over S and then lead, which is K S plus Z over S plus P. Yes? Did we do a PI controller, like without the D? Uh, well, okay, PI is also, well, PI is usually used for steady state performance specification because you have a zero uh, at the origin, you, sorry, you have a pole at the origin, but uh, I think it can also use it for uh, transient performance as well. So maybe I should write PI as well. So PD, PI, K, S plus Z over S. Okay, and the overall idea was if we use the controllers of these forms, we can actually move the closed loop poles 
of the overall system in a manner that the dominant poles would satisfy the transient performance specification or would be close to satisfying the transient performance specification. Now, of course, dominant poles means nothing. Uh, but at least it's a good starting point. And then you iterate over the control system design process to compute the controller that will meet all the performance specifications without any problem. Then we talked about steady state performance specifications. And we talked about final value theorem and how you could use the final value theorem to compute steady state error with respect to either step input, uh, ramp input, or acceleration input. And if you want to improve the steady state performance, you use PI slash PID controller, and you use lag controller, which is also of the form KS plus Z over S plus P. Z is, Z and P is much, much less than one. So it's very, very small. Yes. Um, PID controllers. Didn't we discuss a form of uh, like the equation where it's like KP uh, plus? Right. They are all equivalent definitions. Yeah. So if you have KP plus KI over S plus KDS, this is the same as KP S KDS squared plus KI over S. And then this can be factorized into k s plus z1 s plus z2 over s. Okay. What I want to show is that different controllers have different forms, but there is still some sort of similarity. You are either putting zeros or you are putting poles at appropriate location in order to meet the specifications. Okay. Now, in the case of, so this part is easy. This part is something that we all understand. So nothing much to discuss here. So Ruth Hurwitz is something that you have used quite a lot of time now uh, in assignments as well as in exams. Nyquist plot is something that you have done before. Gain margin and phase margin is, again, something that you have, uh, you know exactly how to calculate it. And all you need to know is whether if the margins are positive, you are in good shape, your closed loop system would be stable. If your margin is negative, you use lead lag, lead controller, or lag controller, or any of the other controllers to improve the gain or phase margin in order to make sure that the closed loop system is stable. Now, in the case of root locus, so now, now the goal is not to assure stability of the system, but the goal is to meet the performance specification. In order to meet the performance specification, we want to make sure that the poles of the closed loop system are at an appropriate location within the complex plane, within the S plane. So if you have a system with an unstable pole, you want to somehow move this pole in the closed loop. You want to move this pole towards the complex plane, uh, sorry, towards the left half plane, okay, not towards the right half plane. So in proportional controller, we have only one parameter we can pick, which is KP. That's the only thing we can pick. So if you can pick one parameter, you can only move along a line. Okay? And that line is known as root locus. So if I can only control my, so think about, think about it this way, if I can only uh, control my vx, so let's say this is the x-axis and vx is the velocity along x-axis. If I have the control of only controlling the x 
uh, vx, then in that case I can only move in one direction. I cannot move in the y direction, right? Because vx is the only thing I can control. So this means, uh, so this is very, so this basically tells you that you have only one degree of freedom and with one degree of freedom you can move along a one dimensional space, okay? So in the case of proportional controller, that one dimensional space is actually the root locus. So you can only place the poles, the closed loop poles, along the root locus, and you cannot place anything, any closed loop pole outside of the root locus. So let's do an example. Uh, this is the example I gave in midterm two. So we have a root locus with triple pole and then two zeros here. And it looked something like this. Something is missing. What was missing? Oh, sorry, not like this. So you had the root locus, which looked like So this was the root locus. And if I wanted to place my closed loop poles here, I cannot do it. There is no way I can do it because it doesn't lie on the root locus. So I cannot use a simple proportional controller to determine where the closed loop poles are going to be. I mean, to, uh, we cannot use the root locus to place the poles where we want it to be, the closed loop poles where we want it to be. We can only place the closed loop poles along this root locus curve. So that's, so we realize that that's a problem. So we need to have more degrees of freedom. We need to be able to choose more parameters in the controller in order to uh, move the poles at locations which are desirable from a control systems perspective or from the performance specification perspective. So we looked at PD controllers, PI controllers, PID controllers. So we have two parameters to choose here, K and Z. K and Z. In this case, I have three parameters, K, Z1, and Z2, or KP, KI, and KD. These are the three parameters I can pick. In the case of lead compensator also, we have three parameters to pick, K, Z, and P. Now, because we can pick more parameters, now we have expanded our um, capability to place the closed loop poles at various locations within the S plane, but certainly we cannot cover the entire S plane even with these controllers. So with, say, PID controllers, uh, if you use a PID controller on this particular uh, system, this is the root locus, maybe the PID can place the poles in this area, but not in other areas. If you have lead controller, you can perhaps place the pole in this area, but not in other areas, right? And the whole idea of control system design is to try different controllers to meet the performance specification. So you change the performance specifications to the locations of dominant closed loop poles, so the dominant closed loop poles must satisfy, uh, must be in this region in order to meet the requirements and then you pick an appropriate controller to uh, place the poles at that particular location. Is that clear? Does that make sense? Now, same thing with steady state performance. You wanted, you used final value theorem to compute ESS, and now you want to reduce the value of ESS, perhaps eliminate it completely, so you want the steady state error to be zero. And in order to get the steady state error to be zero, you want the uh, low frequency gain of GCG to be pretty high. Um, and for that, you have to use either a PI controller or PID controller. So what does the integral term do? It accumulates all the errors it has seen so far. So until the error goes to zero, it continually updates the amount of effort it is putting into the controlling the system. So remember, PI controller, the output of a PI controller is 
kp multiplied by et plus ki integral 0 to t e tau d tau. So as long as this is positive, it will start outputting uh, an effort that is always increasing. As soon as e tau goes to 0, this part of the controller will become stabilized in the sense that the effort will be constant after that. It won't increase or it won't reduce. But as long as there is error, this effort will continually get updated. And, um, and it will affect the output of the system. So that's the reason why PI controller, that's one of the reasons why PI controller uh, achieves the steady state performance because it continually tracks the, in, the error and makes appropriate changes in the effort to make sure that the output leads to zero error. Now there are also mathematical reasons why PID controller leads to zero, um, zero error, which is if you look at the final value theorem, let me, let me write it on the board. So ESS is equal to limit S goes to zero, S RS. one over one plus GCS G of S. And so for a PI controller, limit S goes to zero, GCS is infinity, okay? So that's another reason why ESS is reduced, the steady state error is reduced because of a PI controller or a PID controller. So what I'm saying is limit S goes to zero, GCS is infinity for PI and PID controller. So it leads to uh, less steady state error. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. A PD controller has a problem that it looks as the it looks at the derivative of the error. Now, if you have measurement noise, then your error will have high me measurement noise as well. Um, so, I'm trying to think where, in what system would you have measurement noise? So, audio systems, right? So, there is some background noise in this room, and so if the microphone is picking up my voice, but it is also picking up all the background noise, and if you have a PD controller which uses this audio signal, it's going to take the error, it, it's going to take the derivative So this is KP ET plus KD DE over DT. So this term will be amplified due to noise. So that's the reason why um, you want to be careful when you use a PD controller because you don't want to amplify the control signal because of the inherent noise in the sensor. Um, sensor noise is pretty common in audio systems, in uh, camera systems. Uh, you could also have uh, high noise in pitot tubes in aircraft, which is measuring the pressure uh, of the air. So quite a few sensors where you have very high measurement noise or where you could have very high frequency noise and that high frequency noise can creep into your system and can uh, create a lot of uh, problem for your control system. So make sure when you use PD controller, you keep KD, you keep KD as small as possible. Some of you might uh, take graduate level classes in filtering. So filtering attempts to reduce the measurement noise in the error and therefore, if you have to, if you are forced to use KD with high values, then you must have a filtering algorithm to reduce the noise in the, uh, in the sensor. How many of you have heard the term filtering before? Filtering? Oh, okay. So yeah, so you use filters, Kalman filters, 
particle filters, etc. So these are more sophisticated filters. So you use these filters to reduce the noise from your sensor. Yes. Yeah, okay. Let's think about it. So PD controller comprises of a zero and a gain, okay? So if I look at this particular uh, root locus, I have three poles at the origin and I have two zeros. If I use a PD controller, I'm going to add an additional zero. Let's say I add a zero here. Okay, how is that going to change the root locus? Um, so this is the, okay, let me not add it here. Let me draw another root locus. So this is the root locus of G. Now I'm drawing R locus of G multiplied by S plus Z. So this S plus Z is the PD controller there. So I have three zeros now. So remember what happens when you increase the gain, your poles mo starts moving towards zeros, right? So we'll have the same thing here. And so your root locus is going to look something like this. And what do you notice? Some of these, uh, so at high gains, one of your poles was going to infinity, minus infinity. In this case, that doesn't happen. Those poles go to one of these two zeros. Okay? So that's how it changes the system behavior. Um, And that's how you place the poles of the closed loop. So this was not possible. This would never be possible with just a simple gain controller. But because you had an extra degree of freedom of placing a zero on this axis, on the real, real axis, uh, you're able to completely change the way the root locus behaves for the entire system, compensated system. Question? OK. Now, what's the topic for, so let me do an audience poll. What's the topic that is most difficult for you guys? So I'm just going to cover that topic now. Say lead, lag. lead lag. You know, for lead lag, you just have to go through those steps. Uh, do you want me to go through those steps or? Yeah, I guess. Yes. How many of you want, how many of you want to study lead lag? Yes. Sir. Okay, good. Uh, let me pick up an example from the book. And if you have time, could you also like go over like taking the requirements and converting that to poll locations? Oh, the poll locations? Uh, if you can incorporate that into it. Or if you don't have time, that's cool. I mean, that is more important because... Uh, let's see. Let me write the... Let me go through the... Because that is an important topic. How many of you want to know how to transform the transient performance specification to dominant closed loop pole locations. Okay, quite a few people, okay, so you win. <laughs> uh, I am going through chapter five. There it is. Okay. Okay, there is performance specification. So for a second order system, K over 
s square plus 2 zeta omega n s plus omega n square. Uh, it has two poles plus minus, no, minus zeta omega n plus minus square root of zeta omega n square minus omega n square. Okay. So for the second order system, you can actually compute P O T S T S T P and T R. You can actually compute many of them in closed form. So let me write those expressions. Will we get a second order system? This is for a second order system. Like in the, in the, in the test, in the test, would you give us a second order system, or would you give us a higher order? No. So I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to give. <laughs> <laughs> You know, people have become very intelligent, okay? So I won't tell you what I'm going to give, but what I will tell you is, even if you have higher order system, you translate the performance specification as if it was a second order system, and you're just placing the dominant poles, not all the poles, okay? So in a fifth order system, you have five poles, but there will be a pair of dominant poles, and you're trying to place those two dominant poles at an appropriate location. Okay, and you just ignore the other three poles completely because they are not dominant. Do the poles of the controller itself have to be farther away from the poles of the system? No, the there is no such requirement. Okay. Only, you will only do that if the, if the performance specification will be met by keeping the pole at a far off place versus pole at a near off place. But that is completely up to you. There is no such requirement that the poles have to be far apart. So this is 100 exponential minus zeta pi over square root 1 minus zeta square. Settling time is 4 over zeta omega n. Peak time is pi over omega n square root 1 minus zeta square. And the rise time, tr, Oh. It's an approximation 2.16 zeta plus 0 0.6 over omega n. Is that the 9, 10 to 90% thing? That's 10 to 90%, yeah. So rise time means different to different people, so this is 10 to 90%. 90% rise time. Similarly, this is a 2% settling time. Okay, some people use 5% settling time, but we are using 2% settling time. Okay, so for a second order system, we can actually compute these four quantities. Uh, I mean, of course, this is approximate. This is a very good approximation. So we can compute some of these things by hand. Now. You have a fifth order system and I give you performance specifications. Uh, naturally, you cannot meet the performance specification for, so if I give you a performance specification for a fifth order system, you don't have a closed form expression to know where the pole should be placed to meet the specification. So what's the starting point? Well, over the last 100 years, people have found this to be very useful. We just place the dominant poles and ignore the rest. So what defines dominant poles? The ones that are mostly to the left? The, the ones that are closest to the imaginary axis. Okay. okay. So you could have real poles, clo real pole closest to the imaginary axis. You could have imaginary, real plus imaginary part. So you could have poles that look like this. Uh, but in these cases, you sort of ignore this pole and you just look at the 
poles with uh, some sort of imaginary part. Okay. Let's go back. So why is dominant poles important? Do you know why dominant poles are important? So let's say I have a system where poles look something like this. No, that, that, is, that is completely, that's a robustness issue. So we are not talking about robustness. So what does it mean for these poles to be dominant? So let's assume that this distance is very far. There was some comment? No, I just said the ones closest to the imaginary axis, the dominant poles have the biggest impact on the system. Have the biggest impact on the output. Okay, so you give it a step, inpo step input. Uh, you have a GS, you give it a step input 1 over S, and you look at the output. And the output is largely determined by the location of these poles and not of these poles. Okay? There is certainly a small contribution of these poles, but the majority of the contribution is because of these two poles. And therefore, these are known as dominant poles because if you have a percent overshoot condition, it is largely dependent on where these poles are placed, and it doesn't really depend on where these poles are placed. Okay? So that's why dominant pole is important. And therefore, you are generally, whenever you, give, you are given transient performance, you are generally looking at the dominant poles, particularly the ones which have uh, some imaginary part. Which doesn't mean that if you place the dominant pole at the location you started with would lead to the behavior of the system, but it's a good starting point. Okay? It just gives you a starting point. After that, you have to go through some trial and error to figure out how to meet the performance specification. But at least you have a starting point from where to start. Otherwise, there is no starting point because for fifth order system, there is no closed form expressions which tells you where the what the percent overshoot would be, what the settling time and peak time would be, and so on. Okay. So now someone told me that I am given the following specification. So percent overshoot is less than or equal to 15%. Ts less than equal to four seconds. Uh, let's put Tr less than equal to one second, and so on. What's the step one? Well, step one is to transform all these requirements into requirements on omega n and zeta. So let's uh, look at step one. So PO less than or equal to 15% implies zeta for the dominant closed loop poles should be greater than or equal to 15, right? So 0 0.52. 0 0.52. Uh, you had a chart of figures, right, with all these percent overshoot versus zeta relationships. So you just use that to come up with this number. So zeta must be greater than or equal to 0 0.52 for the dominant pole. So in that case, the percent overshoot will be less than or equal to 15%. Ts less than or equal to 4 seconds, I plug it in here to get zeta omega n should be greater than or equal to 1. Tr less than or equal to 1 second would imply 2.16 zeta 
plus 0 0.6 over omega n should be less than or equal to 1. OK? So we have these three expressions that tells me where omega n and zeta should be. OK. Let us try and pick some reasonable value of zeta and omega n. So I'll pick zeta equals to 0. So now, so this is step 1. Now I'm going to step 2. I pick zeta equals to 0 0.6. I pick omega n equals to 3. 3, yeah, 3. Does it meet all the requirements? Does it meet all the requirements? Yes. So the first requirement is met. Uh, zeta omega n is 1.8. That's greater than or equal to 1. So that's good. 2.16 zeta plus 0 0.6 over omega n. That certainly is less than 1 because the numerator is less than 3. So this requirement is also met. OK? Now from here, I can get the corresponding pole. So, so the dominant poles, poles must be, not must be, but should be around So dominant pole should be around minus zeta omega n plus minus omega n square root 1 minus zeta square j. OK, so from these two values, you can get the location of dominant closed loop poles. OK? Now it remains to be seen whether these dominant poles would lie on the root locus or not. If it lies on root locus, what would you do? Fine Sorry? Find k. Find k using what? Root locus? Right? So if, you, if they lie on the root locus, if these dominant poles lie on the root locus, plot the root locus, get the value of gain k using the data tip cursor mode on command. OK? If not, then what will you do? So if they don't lie on root locus, what's the step? Control. Sorry? Control. Sorry. Uh, well, you can also go back and change these values and try and find where, whether there is any point that lies on the root locus or not. So one thing that is helpful in that situation is the following. Yes. Um, if it's TS is less than or equal to 4, um, why is it that we have zeta omega is greater than or equal to 4? Ah, that's a good question. So 4 over zeta omega n is less than or equal to 1, like less than or equal to 4, right? So I take zeta omega n on this side, 4 on this side, I get 1 less than or equal to zeta omega n, okay? In short, the farther you are from, uh, the farther the dominant poles are from the imaginary axis, the quicker the response is going to be with respect to a step input or any other input. Okay. So this way of computing the dominant pole is slightly cumbersome. So what's an easier way? The easier way is as follows. 
So zeta greater than or equal to 0 0.52 that region is given by this, con this cone. Uh, so everything within this region has the value of zeta. So any pole within this region has value of zeta greater than 0 0.52. Can someone tell me what the angle is? Yeah, cos inverse of zeta. So well, cos inverse of 0 0.52, okay? So you plot the root locus, and within the root locus, you compute this value of theta by doing cos inverse of the lower bound on zeta, and use that lower bound to get a region so that if your dominant closed loop pole is within this region, it's going to meet the first requirement. It's going to meet this requirement. Let's look at the second requirement, which is zeta omega, yeah? What changes if the zeta is less than 0 0.52? Oh, so, okay, so that's a good question again. So if zeta is less than 0 0.52, then you're looking at this location, okay? So zeta is less than 0 0.52 here, zeta is great, no, zeta is greater than 0 0.52 here, and zeta is less than 0 0.52 on the other side, okay. Zeta omega n is greater than or equal to one. So that's the real part of this pole. So this is, or let me just draw a solid line. This is zeta omega n is equal to one. And so everything here has zeta omega n greater than or equal to one. Okay. So at least for these two uh, thresholds, it's much easier to identify where in the root locus they, the entire region lies. And then you can pick an appropriate, so Let's look at the, let's draw a root locus here. I wish I had colored chalks. Somebody stole it. Okay, so this is what your root locus looks like, and you can then pick an appropriate point that lies within this region uh, by using, again, the data tip cursor mode on. Just pick a point that is within this region, and that will meet this requirement and this requirement, and you will have to check, do some trial and error to make sure that it meets this requirement as well. Same thing for TP also. For TP also, there is some, uh, some graphs you can get some, uh, does MATLAB give you TP for the dominant closed loop pole or no, not really. It gives you the damping coefficient, it gives you something else. It gives Gain the damping factor omega n, and I think that's it. Yeah, so it doesn't give you TP, but anyways, so TP can also be computed uh, in a similar fashion. So TP, let's say you have TP, less than or equal to 1.5 seconds. This will mean your omega n square root one minus zeta square should be less than or equal to, no, should be greater than or equal to five over pi, no, 1.5 over pi. And then you will have to check whether this point meets all these other conditions or not. Does it meet this condition and does it meet this condition or not? What happens if you ever end up with the zeta like greater than one? Is that, is that other damped? Is that... So greater than one means you are on the real axis. 
No, like if, oh. Yeah. So it's like three or anything like that. Yeah, that means you are, you are here and you are here, something like that. Okay. Okay. So these are your dominant closed loop poles, right? As you increase, keep increasing the value of zeta, let's say by tuning the controller. So you come closer and closer together. At this point, zeta becomes equal to one and you have a double pole here. So at zeta equals to one, you have a double pole at minus zeta omega n. And then after that, your zeta increases and you essentially start moving in this direction. Okay. So obviously we won't be using MATLAB in the exam, so how would we do this? Ah. <laughs> I'm teaching you control systems. I'm not teaching you to do well in exam. <laughs> okay. But anyways, so you have seen how you would design a controller in exam. You have done it already. So you will get something similar and you will have to do it in a similar way. So you've done it in uh, midterm two, right? So you will get the root locus. You will get the data tip at different locations and you will have to figure out what information you need from there. Can you go over how you'd find like the zero if you're doing like a lead lag compensator? Uh, yeah, in lead lag there are two zeros. Okay. Yeah, but we will get to it. Or just maybe the lead. Oh, oh, oh. Maybe just the lead zero. Okay, uh, I guess I'll have to quickly do the lead lag. So anyways, hopefully this part is sort of clear to most of you how to pick appropriate dominant closed loop poles. Now the time is to do the lead lag compensator. Uh, so in the lead lag, so now that you have figured where your dominant closed loop pole should be, and you have also figured out that just, just by using a proportional controller, you cannot really put a dominant closed loop pole at that particular location. You have to move to a lead controller. So lag controller improves the steady state performance. Lead controller places poles at appropriate location. So let's say your root locus again looks like this. And you want to place the pole, dominant pole at this location. So, so how do you design the lead co controller? Well, you place the zero of the lead controller here. So this is your Z or minus Z, right underneath the place where you want to place the dominant pole. And then you put a pole you put a pole of the GC, so this is minus P, such that this angle theta, so this is 90 degrees, this is theta, and this is R, R is the coordinate of this particular complex thing. So you want angle of GR plus 90 degrees minus theta to be minus 180 degrees. So you place the pole P such that theta satisfies this relationship, okay? Once you do that, you have, you have gotten the point Z and you have gotten the point P. And assuming that P is uh, on the farther side than Z, uh, your lead lag controller design is almost complete, so you draw the root locus of G S plus Z over S plus P. <clears throat> so the location of zero is clear, the location of pole is clear, so you need theta to satisfy this relationship. Then you draw the root locus of G S S plus Z S plus P, it might look something like this, and so on. Uh, so it, it might look something like this. Now your root locus passes through R. You use the data tip cursor to find the gain K. So let's say K equals to 45. Then your GC is 45 S plus Z over S plus P, okay? So there is a MATLAB step involved in this process. So therefore, it may not come in the examination. Never mind. <laughs>
see, see, sometimes you can apply your common sense to figure out what will come in the exam and what will not. Uh, maybe you can have a Reddit forum and everyone tries and sort of options or bets on what exam questions will be there and what not. And yeah. So that's the lead compensator design. In the lag compensator design, the important thing is to know you want, so for lag, you want your z over p to be the same as, so you pick z equals 0 0.1 and you want alpha, which is equal to z over p, to be the same as uh, current ESS over desired. ESS, or just pick alpha, which is somewhat bigger than current ESS over desired ESS. And then you get the value of P accordingly. And then your lag compensator is complete. It's S plus Z over S plus P. So lag compensator doesn't move the location of the closed loop pole. All it does is it moves the, it improves the steady state error performance. So one thing that is important here in the lag compensator is as follows. So in the lag compensator, the issue is you have the root locus like this. You have identified that if you pick k equals to 3.4, then the dominant closed loop pole is uh, exactly at the point where you want it to be. And the problem is that the ESS is not met. The steady state error requirement is not met. So then you design your Z and P according to this fashion. So current ESS over desired ESS at K equals to 3.4. So this is current ESS at K equals to 3.4 and desired ESS at, so desired is of course desired at with the controller, with the complete controller. And then your GC is going to be 3.4 S plus Z over S plus P. Does that make sense? So first you draw the root locus, you figure out the dominant closed loop pole location. Uh, so you're given these specifications, you change it to zeta and zeta omega n specifications. You see if the root locus can place the poles at that particular location or not. If your root locus can place it at that location, you just figure out a simple gain controller, 3.4, which places the pole at that location. Then you compute the current steady state error at k equals to 3.4. You compute the desired, well not compute, you're given the desired ESS compute the value of alpha, pick z equals to 0 0.1, and your s plus z over s plus p is the new, the lag controller. And so your overall lag controller will be 3.4 from here, multiplied by s plus z over s plus p from here. Yes? Is the z equals 0.1, is that a pretty good rule of thumb? Uh, yes, it's a, good, it's a good location to keep your z in. So Z has to be much, much smaller than the dominant poles. So typically your dominant poles will be minus one plus something. So Z equals to 0 0.1 is sort of far away from one. Uh, P from alpha? Yeah, P from alpha. <clears throat> okay, it was great to teach you guys and I'll see some of you in my office hours tomorrow. If you have a lead lag controller, yeah. since each of those has a K, do they like combine those Ks? You multiply them together for a new gain? Um, so the lag compensator never has a gain. Okay. Well, I thought, wait, I the so, so first you place the poles at the desired location. Okay, so whatever K you get from that is the overall K for the lead lag compensator. Okay. So a lead compensator